Welcome back, folks. We are now in another new chapter, chapter six. We're getting closer and closer to the end. Now, this next chapter is going to build off what we see, uh, what we've seen in chapter five, uh, with our probability distributions. Probability distributions that we've seen have all been discrete. So now we're going to flip the switch and look at probability distributions that are continuous. So the primary one that we're going to be focusing on is the normal distribution. So we already know what a normal looks like. We got our bell shape. So let's just kind of read through some of the specifics and then we'll jump right in. <clears throat> so our chapter objectives. In chapter two, we looked at the distribution of data. In chapter three, we looked at the measures of data sets, including measures of center and variation. From chapter four, we looked at principles of probability. Chapter five looked at discrete probability distributions. And now in chapter six, we have continuous probability distributions. Now for a normal distribution, it does have a formula. We already know what it looks like. It should be symmetrical, it should be bell-shaped, and it can be described by the equation given as formula 6.1 or 6-1. And then it would be a normal distribution. So in these cases, the mean should be in the middle, which we already knew. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the formula you can see is pretty messy. <laughs> it's got a lot, it's got an E, it's got some, you see the mean and standard deviations in there, we got an X and we got pi in there, pretty crazy. But breathe a sigh of relief, we are not gonna be using it. <laughs> Yay! So no, we're not gonna be using this formula, so don't freak out. Um, but technically, it does have a formula. So if you go into higher level mathematics, higher level statistics, you would be seeing that you would be using that. But we're not. Not for this course. All right. So but before we get into the normal distribution and how we can analyze that with probabilities, we're going to look at a simpler case of distribution. Another one we've talked about, the uniform distribution. So we were going to quickly look at the uniform distributions to help us better understand the concepts we'll learn about the standard normal distribution in general. Areas under the curve relate to probabilities. So we're going to be looking at areas underneath this curve, and that's going to be directly associated with probabilities. And it doesn't matter if it's bell-shaped or if it's uniform, if it's a straight line across, we're going to still use areas to describe probabilities. So what's nice about uniform is the shape. We know it's a straight line, essentially, little variance in it, but when it's continuous, we can actually say it is a straight line. And because of that, it forms a rectangle. And what do we know about areas of rectangles? How do we find areas of rectangles? You should know that one, right? It's just length times width. So if you know the length and width of a rectangle, you can find the area. And in turn, we're gonna be able to translate that to probabilities. So let's take a look at some of the conditions. A continuous random variable has a uniform distribution if its values are spread evenly over the range of possibilities. So again, it's approximately level across, but in this case, we're going to say it's perfectly level. The graph of a uniform distribution re results in a rectangular shape. So let's take a look at a specific example. So they're going to give you the boundaries of your uniform distribution. So in this case, we want X to go from 3 to 7 and the probability to be point to five. So let's draw a picture of it. Pictures are going to be very important in this chapter. If you don't like drawing pictures, well, that might come back to bite you. So you're going to draw a vertical and a horizontal axis. On the horizontal is going to be your X's. So now you don't have to label everything, but just for this starter diagram, I'm going to. So X is on the horizontal and P of X is on the vertical. Now, as far as scaling and you know making each dash the same distance and all that, that's out the window for this set, for this drawings. All we care about is getting a, a set of where the boundaries are. So, I'm going to put x equal to three right here, and I'll put x equal to seven right here. Again, I don't care if the scale's off or it looks weird. I just want a boundary. I want to see a rectangle on the vertical. I'm going to put my 0.25. And so now I'm going to draw a rectangle that kind of encompasses all of these boundaries. 
So there's my rectangle. So that's the world for this problem, whatever it is. If they were talking about probabilities, that would be the outside border. I'm not going outside of that. What's the area of that rectangle? All right, well, let's think. We need the length and the width, right? Well, we already know this dimension, right? There's our 0.25. So we know how tall it is. So how long is it across the bottom? How can we figure that out pretty quickly? If we know this is 7 and that's 3, we should just be able to subtract that, right? So 7 minus 3 equals 4. So we got 0.25 on this dimension. We got 4 on this dimension. So 4 times 0.25 equals 1. Ha, ha, ha. So there's that link to probability distributions. All of those discrete probabilities had to add up to 1. Well, the area of a continuous one has to be equal to 1. So that's the relationship with those. So now we know the criteria to have a continuous probability distribution. So, <coughs> excuse me, similar to probability distributions, continuous probability distributions have two properties that must be satisfied. The area under the graph of a continuous probability distribution is equal to one. So that's the important one. Just like with the summation, that sum of P of X equal to one, that was the important one. The other two were kind of like, meh, not a big deal, but we still had to confirm that they were satisfied. The second one is really a consequence of the first one. There's a correspondence between area and probability or relative frequency. So some probabilities can be found by identifying the corresponding areas in the graph. So because the overall area is equal to one, we can look at subgroups or sub areas of that to describe specific probabilities. Now, as far as the name of the curve or the bell-shaped curve or the uniform distribution curve, technically that's called a density curve. So in general, so if they say the density curve, it could be bell-shaped, it could be straight line, it could be a U-shaped, it could be anything. So whatever that distribution looks like, that's the density curve. All right, so first thing, let's just do one more check. If we have 60, x equals 16,000, 16, excuse me, 200.5, and I'm not sure why there's a big space there, but to 16,202.5 with P of x equal to 0.5. Do the conditions yield the uniform distribution? Well, again, let's just draw a picture. And so I'm going to say x is equal to 16,200.5. x equals 16, not 100, but 16,202.5. And then this is 0.5. All right, so we get our rectangle. But what's the area of it? Well, like I said, we already know this, this dimension here is 0.5. So what's this dimension here? How long is that? Still subtract, right? We subtract the two numbers, and what do you get? Two. So even though you got these gigantic numbers for x, you don't say settle and just say, oh, it's too big. It can't be big. It can't be one. There's no way. The numbers are too huge. Well, no, because they're so close together, it's deceiving. So the area is equal to 2 times 0.5, which equals 1. So the answer is yes. Um, the conditions determine a uniform distribution. So don't be, don't, don't overthink these problems, but just be careful. All right, so now that we know when we have a uniform distribution, what can we do with it? So let's take a look at the second example. So we have given the following uniform distribution, find the probability that a randomly selected weekly salary is greater than $275 and then less than $210. So now we're looking at probabilities. So here's our world. X is equal to 200, X is equal to 300, with P of X equal to 0 0.01. So we're going to need a, a world for each of these parts. So let's do part A first. 
Let's get our world. So we got 200 and 300 and 0 0.01. So there's our rectangle. All right. Now, we want greater than $275. So again, we're talking about money here. So the next thing we need to do is identify where $275 should fall in this, where it makes sense. So 275, is it going to be closer to 200 or 300? Well, yeah, it's going to be closer to 300. So I'm going to just make a rough guess and say, okay, right there is 275. Not perfect, but it's reasonable. Okay, but now the question says, I want to look at stuff greater than, salaries greater than $275. So now I'm going to have to do some shading. And I want to make sure I shade correctly. Because it's greater than 275, I'm going to have to shade on this side. Now, I'm not going to shade over here because then these are these are looking at numbers that are smaller than 275. I want greater than. So I got to shade that side. So the problem boils down to what's the area of that shaded rectangle? So we still need the dimensions. We already know one of them is 0 0.01. So now all we need to know is how long is this part right there? How can we figure that out? Well, 300 is on the top side, 275 is on the bottom side. So that should give us a total of 25 for that dimension. So the area, which is equal to the probability, which is equal to 25 times 0 .0, oops, 0 0.01, or 0.25. So again, area and probability kind of go hand in hand as long as the overall area of your world is one. That's the, that's the condition. So this area, so this probability is 0.25. There's a basically a 25% chance you're going to get a salary greater than 275 for this scenario. And it kind of makes sense. 250 would be right in the middle. 225 so you can see it's quarters so a quarter of of the time you're going to get a salary greater than 275 let's try b so again let's get our world now it seems a little tedious to do these drawings for every one of them but it's going to be even more important when we get to the bell-shaped curves. It's going to be more important. So get used to it. <laughs> it's to your benefit. It's to help. All right. So there's our world. So now 210. Well, 210 is definitely going to be closer to 200. So let's put it down here somewhere. But be careful where you shade. This one wants less than 210. So we're not shading on the right side. We're shading on the left side. So there's our diagram. So we need our dimensions. So what are our dimensions going to be? Now, I'm putting A equals probability. You don't need to put both. I mean, in this case, we don't really need A. But we just kind of know that it is area that you're looking for to find this probability. So, okay, so our probability should be equal to, we already know the one dimensions, 0.01. And we can kind of see, well, if you're going from 210 down to 200, that's only 10. So this dimension here is 10. So we got 10 times 0 0.01, which is 0.10. So 10% of the time, it should be less than $210. So hopefully that makes sense how this works. But we're going to be expanding on this now, looking at the next... Um, part of this, which is looking at the bell-shaped curve and how areas and probabilities intermingle with that. So you're going to need a table from your book. So start looking in the back. So we'll see you in the next video.